Hi everyone, Dr. Steve Brasner here and welcome back to the Lionhearted Dental Practice. Today, for the first time in the history of my podcast, I am doing it outdoors if you're watching. So if you're just listening, you'll hear sounds of boats going by, birds chirping, <laughs> hence the reason for my sunglasses if you're looking. And I don't really know why I haven't done this before, but enough of that. Thank you to all the people, all my colleagues from the United States and Canada, to all over the world, that continue to inspire the reason I do these podcasts each week with you. If there's a chance you're listening for the first time ever, these podcasts were born by me being a guest on some of the biggest podcasts all of you have listened to. And every time I was that guest, I got this amazing onslaught of positive feedback and emails in regards to what I was speaking about. And I just thought a couple years ago that I'll just have my own podcast. It's a little different. I don't really have guests at this point, but I feel, I've said this many times, I want you to think of this as you and I having a chance to talk for, I don't know, 20 minutes, a half an hour about things that could save you time, aggravation, bumps in the road, stuff like that. Doing what we do, being a full-time clinical dentist is not an easy road. Oh my goodness. It is so challenging and it's more challenging now than when I started. So I think you need all the help that I and others can provide for you. So here's what we're going to talk about this week. For the last three podcasts, I've been talking about the things that I thought were the most important and accountable for these amazing weeks, days, sometimes I report to you about, and of course, the year. When I say amazing, I don't mean just the numbers I'm able to produce and collect. I'm certainly part of it. That's part of it. But I also mean the fulfillment. And I'm, when I say fulfillment, I mean of you, Doc. It wasn't always like this for me. And I can feel it now. It's completely palpable. You walking into your practice through the front door. I know lots of you have back doors. And feeling that the people you're looking at feel fortunate that they're your patient. And you had, you're still taking new patients. Now, even you young docs out there, a lot of patients don't know that you take new patients anymore. And the fact that you feel that positive vibe and get to do these challenging procedures and then have patients bring you gifts like they did to me this week. I got a baseball cap from somebody. and uh, Oh, I'm not kidding. Somebody went out and bought me, I can't think of the name of it right now, some kind of ointment. I mean, I mean, talk about heartwarming. Here they are paying for the highest dentist in the area. And they have come, this particular patient's come to me for years. And you see, you can have this. You can be a high fee for service practice. You can opt out of insurance over time, like I did, and still have patients respect and even above appreciate you because everything that we talk about for the last three years you've adopted much of it and you have this special practice now that that isn't your imagination it's not an exaggeration you put if you're listening to me you put enormous work to get to this point and i know many of you are on your way or are there because you write to me and i can feel it and I swear to you, when I developed this thing a few years ago, I didn't know exactly what to talk about each week. And I'm sure I am redundant about the issues like I'm going to be today that I think are the most important to get you closer to this space that I want you to occupy and, and, and appreciate and enjoy. So tonight I'm going to talk about another set of specific issues relevant to when you're in that operatory 
and how it impacts the number of people that you're speak patients that you're speaking to that will very much influence them in a positive way to accept your treatment recommendations. And at the end of the day, man, that is so, so much what determines how you feel. I mean, anybody listening right now, I find it hard to believe that you're fulfilled with just doing direct clinical composite dentistry. Direct, in the office. MODs, DOs, MLs, whatever that is. Okay? And you may have a colleague that does a lot more full coverage than you do. And in, look, for this guy, this one me, the one guy talking to you each week, that wasn't even enough for me. Now, you may be very interested in endo. I know a number of my colleagues that listen are tremendously skillful at endodontics, even though you're not an endodontist. And I know that's the same case for orthodontics. The reason Steve Rasner led you or tries to lead you to the practice that sedates patients or, or is capable of sedating patients because you have a permit, oral sedation, there's endless, endless podcast about this. Then I talk to you about extractions, atraumatic extractions. How many of our patients have told us stories that I was in a chair once for two and a half hours and he put his knee on my chest or something like that? I mean, you hear that everybody hears this story. So it actually does happen sometimes, I believe. So I teach you the atraumatic extractions, which, by the way, is what led me. I couldn't be more genuine with you. I could have given courses on many things. I could have given a course, which I kind of want to do once or twice every other year, on what we're talking about each week in the podcast, how to put it all together to have this, because it does take a lot, and it is hard to get all of it in bits and pieces each week on my podcast and probably others you listen to. But I would like to do that live. And write to me if you want me to do that. We don't have to have it big. It could be 20 of you. It could be 100 of you. I, I would love it. And I, I've alluded to that before. But the reason I teach and went to the New Jersey Board of Dentistry to get it approved for live patient extractions, live patient grafting, live patient implants that you place... And you do, not me. I'm right there, six inches away from you, along with my other amazing instructors, Dr. Gabe Ruiz, Dr. G. I have a periodontist on staff, and Albert Intercanasia, who's a very skilled and tremendous teacher that's also involved with us. So it's, it's a really good doctor class size ratio, Dr mentor ratio. But the reason I chose that is because it is so relevant in the pathway I try to lay out for you. And that pathway, as I said, would be a sedation practice. That alone, even if you didn't do surgery, will blow up positively your practice in a good way. The second thing is taking teeth out. The third thing is extractions and grafting. And then the fourth would be if you know all those skills, I don't know why you wouldn't want to encompass some level of surgical implant dentistry. You don't have to be intimidated, as I've said before, and learn every facet. You can have an amazing, fulfilling career just doing implants on abundant bone patients, patients with thick, forgiving gingiva. I'm, I'm dead serious. I chose implant training because I was so frustrated by 1990-something with the dentures on mandibles that I was delivering. And I took a myriad of courses to improve my skills. And I, I just, I think it's an outdated modality. I realize that you all have patients, some of us do, that do well with a full lower conventional denture. But come on, if we're going to be honest with each other, I mean, that is probably the most profound impact in my career 
of clinical care of adding that service. And today it's easier than ever. So that's why I have those courses. Here's, let's talk about what I want to get to tonight. And it's the patients in the chair that are what I call, number one, that partial denture patient. Two, that I'm losing teeth and there's going to have to be some kind of replacement patient. And I have others here too. I have the advanced perio, but they don't know it patient. And I don't know how far I'll get because you've heard me say before, I try to keep these within 30 minutes or less. So let's go back to that. And I've spent a lot of time in the last three podcasts talking about that opening five minutes. So critical, so important that you and the team that's in that room with you and the atmosphere in that room is so critical to get you to yes. And, and really, not even get you to yes. To have a patient who may not even accept a treatment and leave you, your, work, your office without accepting it, but they still have a good vibe about your practice. That is the goal. And if you do that, then in my opinion, you did not fail in your case presentation. And go back and look up the recent talk I've had about, I tell patients, me being a dentist 40 years ago was like to me being an astronaut. I never use that analogy to the last six months. And I use it because a lot of us can relate to how exciting that thought would be when we were children, right? I don't know, it just popped in my head. And I can tell you that when I say that, and then I just spin off, and patients love it. And then I spin off of that by saying, and I did everything I could in my career to be the best astronaut, if you will, on the planet. I just never stopped training. And if you get into if that's true, you can't lie about this. If I get in to that kind of rap with a patient, they get it, man. They, I just don't think most of you appreciate how rare that five minutes is to patients in general in the population that go to dentist. I think there is a huge segment of patients that go into a place that, for lack of a better word, might feel apathetic, might be tuned out to something else. This might be routine. Next new patient. And, you know, I I try to hold back on saying stuff like that on this podcast because I don't want to be critical of the mass of my co- of my colleagues, because you've a lot of you have looked up to me and what I believe in, and I don't want to put anybody in a negative space. But when I see with my own eyes the abundant stories I've heard over the years, it just makes this road less travel easier. It does. It's not for everyone, by the way. It's not for every patient. There are patients that want to go to good old Joe. You hear me talk about good old Joe all the time. And he is way more popular and more abundant than a lion-hearted dentist. There's no doubt in my mind. So let's get to the stories I want to talk about. I want to talk about the partial denture patients. This is what I mean. You have gathered in your new patient information, which has to be happening. Okay, you don't just have a new patient come in and not know anything about them When you walk into the operatory, you have to be honest when you look in the mirror. If that is what's going on, then that is the number one reason or part of the reason that you don't get enough case acceptance. I know everything I can about them because I designed a new patient intake form that has been used by me for 30 years. And it's not intrusive. It's not over the top. It's, it's almost colloquial, as if Michelle, my new patient coordinator, is just getting to know this new patient who might come to us over the telephone. It's very powerful. And then, of course, I get a report the night before about if there's a new patient and what all these notes that she has taken. And sometimes the note says they been wearing a partial denture for 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. So why am I choosing that patient tonight's podcast because it's an amazing opportunity for you to do a better job 
So let me explain. Is it just me or when you see many of your new patients that have partial dentures, it is an acrylic denture with two wrought wire clasps that were stuck in there by somebody. That means they're bendable. They're not custom clasp. And that patient has been wearing that for maybe 10 years. I had a patient like this three weeks ago, and that partial was to replace number eight, or one one. He had adjacent teeth. He had good bone on the adjacent teeth. And he didn't have sufficient bone for an implant. And I had to make a decision, which is what I've been talking about in the last three weeks, of what was I going to recommend to this patient. And that really is driven by me doing a full exam. Like, what else is he going to need? And he had other needs. And this, a, an implant in number eight on this patient would absolutely have required a bone graft and it was my opinion, based on my exam, based on our talking to each other, his adjacent teeth had restorations, they had great bone, it didn't, it, it was a 300 bridge. That's what, that's what the, part of the treatment plan was, along with a host of other needs that this patient needed. So the reason I'm talking about that is, if it's not that, so let me back up. This is what I say to those patients. And it is the responsibility of my dental hygienist or my dental assistant that if they, they also know what the patient was interested in. And, it, and this story is about the patient that wants something else or a better partial. So in that 3D model collection that you hear me talk about, 3D means I like to reach in, not start a, a, a office-wide search. It is organized, it is available, and it's all it takes is me to reach over and say, let me talk to you for a minute about partial dentures. Now, I have done this after I've examined them. And first, I'll tell them, oh, if they're missing multiple teeth and they liked their partial until recently, it becomes kind of an easy to me patient to please. Do you understand how I'm thinking right now? Right? That's very different than two different patients I'm treating right now that are mid-60s females who, when they came to me, had dentures and wore not, did not wear them. They had no teeth. I am talking about women that took care of themselves, that had plastic surgery, the care, all I'm saying that for is they cared about themselves that much and they dressed nicely and they were handicapped and paralyzed by the fact that they could not comfortably wear a denture. So that discussion with that patient became very complex and we talked about advanced bone grafting that was necessary that they went through for seven months prior to the implants, prior to a fixed prosthesis. We're not talking about that patient right now. We're talking about an everyday patient that you and I get multiple times a year that wants an upgrade of a partial. And I say to them, I say, you know, when you tell me that you have a partial denture, it's kind of like telling me you have a car. I don't know what kind of car you have or a shirt or anything like that. I said, I don't expect that you know that there are multiple types of partials and there's most of them are much better fitting and more sophisticated and look better than the partial you've come to me with today. So I want to explain them to you. So I will go over and first show them what they have because I always have an example of an acrylic partial, which is what many of them wear. Of course, I have examples of conventional partials with cast clasp. And then I'll talk to them about a precision partial where we selectively crown teeth that have attachments for the partial. Now listen, we don't have the forum here today for when to do what with all of these. 
I have obviously a precision. I can tell you one thing we do, and I make this very clear to the patient, and they always get it. I say, if I'm making you a partial, and that's going to be our final way to replace your teeth, then I need to know that the teeth I'm going to use are rock solid, not just with bone, but with the fillings that they have in them now. And you can have a number of partials, some of them, and I go into the different explanations. So even if it's conventional partial with cast clasp, I will make sure I'm 100% positive that the abutment teeth that will be used will be either the fillings will be redone if there's any question in my mind. And that is part of their treatment plan. Their soft tissue is always part of my treatment plan, no matter what I'm doing. So in a lot of offices, this is obviously the case. In a lot of offices, haven't you seen a partial denture from a patient that comes to you? They may be three to six months old. And it's on teeth that needed restorations. You could tell by looking at them that the restorations, I'm not even getting fancy with you right now. I'm talking about an MOD, maybe amalgam. Would you trust a 30-year-old MOD amalgam as one of your abutment teeth? I wouldn't. So I give an earnest opinion, and they know it's earnest, because I make it a point almost with every patient who I think is going to make somewhat of a sizable investment. I, with every of those patients, I, I tell them, listen, if you don't know where you're sitting today, I hope it's crystal clear that my interest, I want to be your dentist, and I hope you're your dentist the rest of indefinitely. It's hard for me to say and make a big deal about that because I don't have a retirement date in my mind, but I am in my late 60s. So nobody's ever stopped and said, well, what, what's your indefinitely, what's that mean? Two years? Nobody's ever said that to me. But I would say I want to be your dentist forever. I even you say that sometimes. And I say I want to be your dentist forever. So when I make recommendations to you, it's never about the business side of it for me. I don't care. I mean, I do care because I want to give you the best care I can. But from a business point of view, I don't care what, that you choose this or that. I just want you to choose something that you completely understand because I've taken the time to, and showed you to make you understand and that you're happy with that so that you refer your friends and people you like to me. I mean, that's my goal. I say it like just like that because you got to understand I feel like the need to say something along those lines because I am certain that this patient never had anybody look at them that way, look at the future, right? Look at these, because they come in with such average dentistry, in my opinion. So when I have a partial denture patient, it is r never just a replacement acrylic partial with wrought wires. In fact, that is the type of partial I use for my temporary partials, because I'm so often removing some teeth and I need to put them in a transition prosthesis. Can you understand that? Okay. The second patient I want to talk about is I'm losing my teeth. I'm losing some teeth. So this is that patient that when they call and they give their information, they're saying, I have a really loose tooth. And if the patient says, I, I, I very often have patients say to me, I have a little chip on the tooth and I can't find the tooth, it's at the gum line. This is the complete opposite. I'll have a patient say, I have a loose tooth, and a hard sneeze might take the tooth out. And of course, that tooth is loose very often because we have a mouth full of perio or traumatic occlusion. So if you hear me talk over and over again about a comprehensive exam, I can't give you better examples that just shout at you that this is why we need to do it. If it's a partial, we certainly want to put the parcel on a, on a solid base. We want to give the patient the ability to have fixed before we commit to a partial. 
And look, if a patient comes in and has worn a partial and is happy with it for 20 years, I'm probably not even thinking about fixed. It's the truth. Unless it's flagrant, like the patient I alluded to that was missing one tooth and could have had a bridge. And I, I have seen that more often than once in a blue moon. But now I'm talking about the patient we so often see because of the nature of our science that you and I chose. That nature is a lot of pathology, including loose teeth, is asymptomatic and not painful. And people put it off because they don't want to make the investment or because they're in denial. I, I don't really know why. So that patient requires a very thorough, and I, I want you to know, they know, and I'm trying to tell you this so you can adopt some of this. They know, and I know they know, in the chair, the patient knows, I am not trying to upsell them. I am trying to be responsible. So how could you be responsible by just addressing one loose tooth? And remember, our patients are screened by our new patient coordinator. If you don't know what that is, then you need to write to me and see the questions I have Michelle ask the new patient and even give them a chance on that new patient call to opt out and not come to us. They Listen, another fact that's behind all this is I've been in the same spot for 40 years in a community that's pretty small. So a lot of people by now, for God's sakes, know what kind of practice I have. And quite frankly, if you've been there for more than 10 years, they know what you are. They do. So this patient that's got this stunning amount of pathology, to me, kind of knows who I am already. So I don't feel funny in any way telling them the absolute full spectrum of what they can have but realizing that it could be shocking. When I finish my exam and my recommendations, whether it's visit one, which I always tell you, if you know it on visit one and you can stand in front of a board of dentistry and defend your decisions on visit by making a treatment plan at that visit, then you're good to go. Think of it like that. But if you quick up a quick treatment plan, because I said I can do it on visit one often, and you can't stand behind that, then that wouldn't be a solid ground to offer a treatment plan. But I give the, when I'm done my treatment recommendations, I walk to the new patient coordinator who also interviewed them. She interviewed them over the phone, and she interviewed them in person in the office. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Go back to the early podcast from three years ago. And I will often say to her what I think is going to happen. And sometimes I hear myself saying on this perio patient that we're talking about. I hear me, myself saying, I know I've said this to you before, Michelle, but if this patient moves forward with my recommendations, I will be shocked. And then the next thing I hear Michelle say to me is how much time you need. I guess this is an important part of this week to end with. I know I didn't invent this saying, but if you don't take the shot, obviously you can never score. I think it's a hockey comment. And you have to, you have to know during treatment planning and case treatment recommendations and case presentations you really do need to be well-trained in all the aspects of what that patient can have, right? They're losing teeth, and I'll have to pick up on this. You have to explore. I'm talking about a patient that hasn't lost teeth yet, mind you. We all get that. And they finally arrived at that moment this day in your office. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared to look at them thoroughly, see which teeth you can keep, see which teeth you can't. Is this going to be a fixed case, an all-on case, a removable all-on case? Is it 
going to be a, a, a phase treatment. And in phase treatment, 100% of the time, you have to include soft tissue care. That's not a one-time thing, and you have to, no pun intended, drill that into that patient. When I do these with you each week, I realize how much more we have to talk about. And I don't know if they're helping you. I know many of them they are helping you because you write to me. But I get into this, and I know sometimes I go off on these tangents, sometimes like every week. And this week I felt compelled to tell you about patients that I see in my chair. That's where these stories come from. That partial patient I keep talking about. That I'm losing teeth, and I know I need something. Well, I'm very, very careful to point out if it's a denture, what a denture looks like. You heard me tell you about having 3D denture models. What if it's not a denture? Then I got to go through all the partial types of dentures, and and then I go into the process with them if I feel they're going to choose a partial denture. By the way, I didn't say it. Very often, my partial denture patients are combination implant zest locators, even sometimes a bar for part. They're like, they're keeping four teeth, but we're supplementing two implants as well. It's about as far as I want to go this week. I hope you enjoyed my podcast from the outside. I did. Please write to me and let me know how we're doing. It always inspires me to do more. See you next week on The Lionhearted.